You are a sight for sore eyes, but how about making those sore eyes bright eyes? The wonderful world of ophthalmology tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Well, it's the year 2020, so our focus tonight is on vision. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a true or false question. Dry eyes sometimes causes watery eyes. It's often due to medicines like decongestants or bladder spasm medicines and occurs in twice as many women than in men. True or false? We'll have the answer at the end of tonight's program. Joining us tonight is Dr. Vance Thompson, an ophthalmologist and a surgeon with Vance Thompson Vision, headquartered in Sioux Falls. Welcome, Vance. You know, and of course, this was one of those deals where it was a last minute call, rescue us, Vance, we need your fill in. Our previous guests had dropped out. Uh, at the last minute, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Thank you. Coming in Thanks as a friend. Thanks for having me. It means a lot to me. So you are an ophthalmologist, but you have a uh, uh, you have a, a particular uh, uh, strength and concentration on LASIK surgery, and also on lens implant. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story and how did all of this evolve. Well, I grew up in small town South Dakota. Spent, Gregory? Yes, and spent actually half my childhood in Lake Andes and the other half in Gregory. Graduated from Gregory, went to USD. Played football at Gregory? Yes, and basketball <laughs> and baseball. <laughs> A Gregory gorilla. Oh, there you go. Yes, and uh, after USD, I went on to medical school at USD thinking I was going to be a family doc like my dad in Gregory and my grandpa in Watertown. And while in medical school, spent time with an eye surgeon and his father, Dr. John and Tom Wilcoxon in Yankton, and it just, I was smitten by the microsurgery, by restoring vision, and I went on to go into ophthalmology, did my residency at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and then I did a fellowship in advanced cataract and refractive surgery in Kansas City, and then came back to South Dakota in 1991 and I decided to have my practice focus be my fellowship of working on the cornea and the lens, cataract and refractive. No, uh, somehow you got it in the very beginning of LASIK surgery research. Tell me, yes. how did that happen? Well, you know, I had this fellowship director who taught me a lot about research. And we did this study that became known as the blind eye study in laser vision correction. And basically our FDA that you know, helps to watch over new technologies coming to our country, making sure they're brought in as safe a, a manner as possible, decided we wanna see how this laser that's supposed to cure nearsightedness and astigmatism, how it works on eyes that can't see before we're gonna allow it to be studied on eyes that can see. But, but uh, were these people who were blind not because of their cornea, but because of... Their optic the, nerve or their retina. Right, so no matter what you did, yes. they are blind. And that's kind of how they start new things, but the corneas had to be pristine to study because really what we were supposed to prove is that we could change the shape of the cornea, the most powerful focusing element of our eye, and that the power change would be accurate and the cornea would heal clear. And that study, which became very famous, uh, proved that and that's what led to the sighted trials. And then I came back to South Dakota and that's when I got to be involved in the beginning of laser vision correction, testified in Washington to help get it approved, teach it all around the world. And it's been something that was such an honor to do from my home state. Right, so here you you brought LASIK to, to South Dakota. Yep. Now, you're, you, you were the only one initially, of course, but then how many other LASIK surgeons are in, in the state now? Oh, I think there's, you know, I think there's like six others now. And, and so there's good, this state is full of great doctors, including eye surgeons. Okay, 
So uh, now LASIK is one of those deals. Let's just explain it. Uh, it isn't la laser. It's LASIK. Why did they, what's the name mean? Yep. Well, LASIK, L-A-S-I-K, stands for Laser Assisted In Situ Keratomalusis. And keratomalusis means keratocornea, malusis, to shape. So LASIK is really a way of saying Shaping you're using a laser to shape the cornea. And in the 1940s, an ophthalmologist in Bogota, Colombia was taking off uh, the front part of the cornea, freezing it in liquid nitrogen, lathing it on a what was called a cryolathe, and then sewing it back on the cornea. So I mean he was cutting it right. with, with a yep. mechanical knife of some kind. And it would change the shape. And so we knew that you could make flaps on the cornea, you could change its shape, but once you brought laser to the equation, it became so much more accurate, and that's how it grew so fast. So uh, the, uh, what it, cor it does is it corrects people's vision significantly. Right. Now, now I'm, I, I, one of the questions that I always uh, had was, of course, the most powerful concentrating uh, thing that we have in the eye must be the lens and you're messing with the cornea which is uh, just a small part of this whole thing and you taught me what? That is just the opposite. That really the cornea provides 80 percent of the focus power of the eye just by its curvature and the lens which sits right behind our pupil provides 20%, but also does something else magical. In our younger years, it zooms in to read. And then when we look at a distance, it zooms out. And that's what we lose in our 40s, and that's why we start needing reading glasses or bifocals. Right. <laughs> so it was like whoever designed those eyes didn't plan on us living past 40. Well, I think they wanted us to spend more time at a distance. <laughs> 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 or maybe we're just going to be in the TP and we're going to be working on uh, closer yeah. things. Or yep, something. but the lens, you know, you've heard that the two most for sures in life are death and paying taxes. Yes. Well, we've heard of people that don't pay taxes. Everybody dies. Presbyopia, the loss of near vision, is for sure happens to everybody. I say the two for sures in life are death and presbyopia. Presbyopia. <laughs> it happens to everybody. Everybody loses their near vision. You can see for a, a distance, but you lose your near vision. You, right. It, things get further, you have to hold your book yes. further away. Yep, your arms get too short, and then you <laughs> need reading glasses um, or bifocals, or you can have surgery for it too. So when did they come up with bifocals? I mean, was that Benjamin Franklin? Benjamin Franklin was the inventor of bifocals. Isn't that amazing? Didn't that blow you away. Yeah, he invented a lot of things. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin. Yep. So, uh, what about readers? I mean, so I let's say I, I'm I'm okay with uh, just having not having LASIK surgery right. and having uh, readers when I go to bed at night. Right. Uh, how do I pick that? How do I how do I know which reader to pick? You know, there's a thousand of them and they're yeah. cheap. Well, I don't know if I want to tell you because you're not going to go get an eye exam then. Oh. And so my point is, though, it's very important to see your local optometrist or ophthalmologist for a yearly eye exam to check for glaucoma, to make sure your eyes are healthy. They can look at the blood vessels and see if you have high blood pressure or diabetes. Or, you, or tumors in the back right, of your eye. Right. You want that eye exam. But when it comes to reading glasses, um, if you don't have a distance prescription and you're 20 20 at a distance and you want to see good up close, those readers at the drugstore do work well. They don't last as long as the wonderful frames uh, that your optometrist gives yes. you. They don't have the balancing um, and the high end lenses that you can get, um, but they do work and they help a lot of people. And they're cheap. But I do go see your doctor every year. So I'm going to say this to the, this group right here and now. You need to see your doctor every year, starting at 40. Yes. 40 years of age, every year, 
get in and be seen. I mean, there's a reason glaucoma sneaks up on you. You don't know. And before that, every two years, okay? So you don't just wait until you're 40 because you just said it, glaucoma. Elevated pressure in the eye. It's kind of like elevated pressure in our body. Lots of times we don't feel high blood pressure. Yeah. We need to go see our doctor and get it measured every year. Same thing with your eye pressure. Every year you want your eye pressure measured because what happens is glaucoma steals your peripheral vision first. And I'll see these 80 year old guys were so proud they never needed to see a doctor. And now the only they're blurry they and they have lost all their vision from glaucoma. It's a tunnel and it's not like cataract surgery. Cataract surgery, we can get that vision back. With glaucoma surgery, what you've lost, you can't get back. Yeah. As a guy who has glaucoma, I'm glad that I have an eye doctor who monitors my glaucoma in my local community. Right. And, uh, and, and I do want to add, don't be afraid if you have it. It's so treatable and so easy to preserve the vision. I'm talking to the people that don't go get an eye exam to go get it. Yes. So if we get one person to go get that eye exam, yep. maybe we've, we've, we've made a difference yep. to humankind. Right. Uh, let's just talk about uh, lens implants because that's the other thing that you do besides LASIK. Yes, a I did lot it of surgery. 25 times today. 25 yeah. eye implants. Yes. So uh, there are there's a lot said about implants. So those are lenses. Yes. Not as powerful of a focusing ability to, as the cornea. Yeah. But the lenses are important, and people get uh, they get uh, cataracts. Right. Now it used to be that they you wouldn't you, they'd go in to see the eye doctor. The eye doctor would say, "Not yet this year. You're gonna you're getting a cataract. It's coming, but you don't need it yet." And then the next year, you don't need it yet. Somewhere along the line, okay, it's time now. What is that time? Well, in the old days, they talked about the cataract getting ripe, because right. what you were doing was taking out kind of a hard little rock through a very large incision modern day cataract surgery, you're removing it through a very teeny incision, so you're liquefying it with ultrasound. Right. We call it phaco emulsification. Phaco lens emulsify. emulsify. And, and so the time to have cataract surgery is when it's causing blur that can't be corrected with glasses. And so there's not really a time to let it get ripe. We remove cataracts at a lot earlier stage now than we used to. If they're causing blur, we don't make people suffer for another 10 years until it's ripe. But I also think it's important to realize that if you hear the word cataract, that doesn't mean you need surgery. Lots of times people with cataracts still have good vision and they start to think, oh, I have a cataract, I need to have surgery. No, 70% of people never have their cataracts removed, even though we all get cataracts. We all get them. We all get wrinkly hair and gray skin. Yeah. We all get cataracts. It goes with aging. It does, and 30 to 35% of them get removed because they're causing blur. And that's the time. That's blur. the time. Blur. Well, let's, uh, we've got a, a video of uh, you doing a cataract placement, but this is a more fancy uh, cataract. Before we show the video, can I explain what happens in surgery? Yeah, yeah. That's because, fine. you know, the cornea, the front window, and then we have our pupil, and right behind our pupils, our lens. And I like to think of it as almost like a little grape skin. Uh, uh, it's a grape with a grape skin. And what we do, so now let's say the patient is laying down and, and looking up. We remove the central five millimeters of that grape skin, or we call it a capsule, clean out the cataract, and then that same capsule that held your old lens is gonna hold your new lens implant. And then we put the new lens implant and what you're about ready to see, the capsule, you'll see the five millimeter opening, the cataract's gone, and you're gonna see the implant going into its new home for the rest of its life. It, it filled, uh, uh, surrounded by the old grape skin. Yes, and that grape skin is what can get cloudy that we sometimes laser, but this is also a very special type of implant. And I think we can look at the video now. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's see this. Yes, so explain what's happening then. So now the implant's been folded like a little taco or burrito, and it's made out of silicone, and it's going into that capsule. We got a nice five millimeter opening. That's called the haptic that's going in now. And that haptic is what holds the optic in the center of the pupil. 
And that is what we call a light adjustable lens implant. A light adjustable lens implant. Now the majority of lenses that have been implanted are not adjustable. The majority of lenses are not adjustable. They are a power that was made at a company and then put inside the eye and then if it isn't the perfect power you wear glasses or can have laser vision correction. So, um, so, yeah, is this, what, what do you think is going to happen in, in the future with this? Is this, uh, is this the new evolution? Or well, we gonna, do we going to need this all the, will we need this always? You know, when you do cataract surgery and you're trying to find that perfect power for someone to see good with their implant, right. you measure the length of the eye, you measure the curvature of the cornea, you measure the distance from the cornea to where the lens is going to sit. We call it the effective lens position. And it goes into a formula, and then you put that implant in. And it So you pick the implant that has the exact formula that you have uh, put together with your measurement. The power meant for that person. Right. And then at three weeks post-op, if that implant sits one millimeters or two millimeters from the pupil, or that incision heals with some astigmatism, you can help them see better with glasses or you can do laser vision correction, but it's not unusual to feel like if I'd have known how they were gonna heal, I would have put in a different power. And what's so amazing about the light adjustable lens is at that magical three week time, if the patient says, I wish I was a little more clear, you can adjust it with light to the clarity that they want and that's what's so powerful about this new technology. So, and will they still need reading glasses? It depends on whether or not you decide you want to do what's called monovision, or you decide that you want to have sometimes a multifocal built in, and you can go for good vision without readers, or you can do single vision lenses and have them focus at a distance and wear readers. You have choices to make with what sort of vision you want right. after cataract surgery. But let's look at the, 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 the story the, of this new lens yeah. that's light adjustable. We've got a little bit of a roll in that shows uh, what's happening. So if we look inside that lens, what we're really looking at is silicone and there's polymers in there that you can illuminate with light and then you can have them connect to each other or we would call photopolymerize or fix them but you don't do all of them because the liquid ones or the ones that aren't fixed will then diffuse in and cause a shape change or change the power of the implant. So there's a shape change that went pushed right. forward, then it went That's pushed it. backwards, now it's... It's just showing the various options. You can take power away from an implant, you can add power to it, you can correct astigmatism, and then when you're happy with the vision, because you can do more than one light adjustment and let the patient try the vision, but once you're happy with it, you illuminate the whole lens and it fix, fixes all the polymer and they get to enjoy that power for the rest of their life. So uh, these, this is called photopolymerization. And a photochemist at Cal Poly in San Francisco yeah. figured out how to do this. This guy won a Nobel Prize, yeah. and this implant is the most precise implant on Mother Earth. Right. Do you anticipate that uh, this will take over, over more and more of the implants? Yes, so, I do. And you would, do you think it will be 100%? Um, well, you know, that always takes time because they're all so expensive. And the other implants work quite well. And for patients that don't mind wearing glasses, they don't need to go to this level because right. the other implants work well. But for patients that want to do a lot without glasses, or maybe they have a complicated eye and it's a complicated calculation, putting an implant that after surgery you can change it to an implant that's perfect for their complicated eye is very powerful. And so we have a lot of patients referred to us for this that want to do a lot without glasses or have a complicated situation. Yeah. So uh, then it's not probably going to be everybody 
but it's going to be a lot of people in the future, yes. and it's a wonderful right. new thing coming. Right. Improved vision, not requiring glasses. Yes, and it's been FDA approved since 2017, so it's something we do rather commonly now. Okay. Uh, so let's just we're going to let's just uh, roll through different ophthalmologic right. issues, but I th I thought those were nice visual things that had isn't the eye fascinating. I think it is. I, it just blows me away how fascinating it is. And uh, I've heard people say that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Yeah. And we do windows. Yeah. <laughs> You're a window guy, aren't you? <laughs> That's, I love that. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's talk about common problems. Uh, dry eyes is a very common problem. Uh, I, I know that probably of the things, uh, the ophthalmologic problems that I ran into as a geriatrician, uh, particularly in the nursing home, people complained a lot about dry eyes. And a lot of the solutions to the dry eyes were uh, often uh, eye drops. So what's your, let's, let's talk about causes of dry eyes for f first. Medicine being, I right. think, probably the most likely cause of right. dry eyes. Well, dry eyes, like you said, are very common. I think they're one of the most underdiagnosed and undertreated things today. And it's something that you really want to think about if you're having comfort issues with your eyes or you're having blur issues. Because our tear film is very therapeutic to our eyes. It has healing factors. It has nutrients. It delivers oxygen to the cornea because there's no blood vessels you yeah, know, for the no cornea. There's no blood vessels in the cornea. Yes. Why would that be? so we can see crystal clear through it. It's our front <laughs> transparent window. It's the window. We don't want blood vessels running through our window. That's exactly right. That and, and so, you know, that, that So has, it gets its blood, so its blood supply really from tears. It, it's exactly right. And it also gets nutrients from the internal aqueous. So inside the eye, uh, the aqueous delivers nutrients to the cornea also. But the tear film, is made in three different locations. We got the lacrimal gland that waters. We got That's the- That's on the out, upper, outer yep, parts of the eye. Yep, right under the bone. And we got the goblet cells in the conjunctiva that make mucin kind of a sugary substance because our watery part is actually going to a cornea that's rather hydrophobic or wants to repel water, but this mucin or sugary substance that coats the cornea makes it hydrophilic, attracts the water. And then, so you got the sugary first, then the water, but if that was the end of the story, that very thin water layer would evaporate. Well, in our eyelids, we have the meibomian glands that secrete an olive oil-like secretion. We call it meibom, but it's an olive oil secretion that creates this little skim that helps lessen evaporation. So the tear film's kind of like a sandwich almost. It's got three layers, and in a good tear exam, you're getting all three layers evaluated. And when I have people come in that say, golly, when I blink, my vision gets better, you don't blink away internal eye problems. That's a surface issue. Or when they say, in certain light, my, my vision can change, and when I blink, it gets better. You want to get that tear film checked because it's the most powerful focusing not only the eye, is right where the air meets the tear. So um, uh, some people will have problems with their uh, m making the making the mucin, right. making the sugary yep. substance, yep. making the low oil layer yep. that prevents evaporation. And so uh, uh, some of that is uh, in uh, people with lupus and yeah. rheumatoid arthritis. Right. They just, they have so Sjogren's syndrome and they just don't make it. Right. Can we stimulate it? Uh, can we? Well, you can. And one of the things that's important for people to realize is when the olive oil's down or the sugary's down, it, it sends a message to the brain that the eye is irritated and it's, it, the watery part tries to flush it. And that's how a dry eye can water. Some people are surprised why their dry eye can water. But all this is very treatable. And so you look at the various components of the tear film and you examine them and you can put people on lubricants if it's a mild dry eye. If you need to use them more than three or four times a day, you want preservative free because a preservative can irritate the eye. And if you need 
more than that, we can do what's called punctal plugs. So our okay. eyes, where what your the, the fluid that is drain that's draining in through your eyes, goes to your nasal uh, system. Nasal system. Yep. So it dumps into that system and, and it, you plug it so you, it doesn't... Yep, you put a plug right in the drain. So the tears you make don't leave your eye so fast. And what I love about plugs, there's nothing better than your own tear. So when you put in that little plug and your own tear is now what's lubricating and not leaving so quickly, that's very powerful also. But we can also do things like stimulate the mybum. Sometimes we'll heat it and then compress it so it flows better. We can put people on medications that can help the mybum flow better to protect the tear film. So there's all sorts of things to do. And the other thing that's important is to respect the inflammatory state of a dry eye. So a lot of women, for instance, as the hormones are reducing, those hormones actually pr protect the lacrimal gland and the eye surface. And so you get some of those inflammatory cells that come in, like in Sjogren's, but it can happen in people without those types of collagen vascular diseases, and they need anti-inflammatories. Well, steroids will work. Well, we both know that long-term steroids cause cataracts and glaucoma. And so there's drops like Restasis, which is cyclosporin, or there's Zydra, Zydra which is Lefitograss, and they're both powerful anti-inflammatories that don't give the side effects of a steroid. And so even though they're expensive, boy, have they helped Zydra, dry eyes. Zydra and Restasis. Yes. But they're prescription. They're prescription. And they're not cheap. Then they're not cheap, and you need to see your doctor but for that. But they're those. like steroids. They turn off the inflammatory process, but they don't give the side effects of the steroid. Exactly. So that's, that's a really important thing. Yep. Now, I know that a lot of people will talk about adding uh, a, a drug that takes away the red, the red out. Yeah. Uh, and there's a variety of different kinds of red out kind of medications and so, so forth. Uh, Lumify right. apparently is one of them. Right. Are those safe? Well, they've been through FDA trials. Uh, Lumify is a very low dose of a drug called bromonidine, and that is very effective at whitening eyes. I, you know, think we need to see how this goes over the years. For instance, in the world of Visine, people will, you know, take those drops that will constrict the blood vessels. But sometimes the blood vessels, they do it too long and the blood vessels become dependent on it. And then when you stop the visine, you yeah. get- Red eyes. Uh, uh, worse, because you get very congested eyes. The same thing can happen with you know decongestants. You probably tell your patients about things like Afrin. You don't want to abuse them because over the years, it can actually have a rebound effect. Right, and many, many drugs do that. Right. Know. And so with Lumify, it's felt to have less of that rebound effect and is felt to be safe and what we call efficacious or effective for dry eye. And that's why the FDA approved it. And, uh, but I, I, but I look forward- But you're a little reluctant. Well, I just look forward to more time. I just think it's important for people to treat the root cause and not the symptom. And so if someone has red eyes, to check those cosmetics. Is there an allergy issue? See an allergist. Get your tear film you know, evaluated and, yeah. and think about treating the root cause. Is it you know, like the cat in the house or yeah. what is it? And, and, and so things like Lumify though do help people. I just don't have a ton of experience because it's kind of new. So let's just talk about Afrin for a minute because it's a perfect example of what is called tachyphylaxis. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a rebound effect, right? And there is, uh, there are a lot of medications that, if you take, you take it initially, morphine, right? It works really good, right? Oh, I want that again. Yeah. Uh, second dose works, but not quite as well. Right. Third dose, not quite as well. Go higher dose, higher dose. Ah, uh, I'm, I'm getting relief. Got to go higher dose again, higher dose again, higher dose again. Now you're an addict. Now you're an addict. 
and then you stop it, you have withdrawal yep. pain. Yep. Uh, you you can have with afrin, you know, you you use afrin and you clear. Yeah. And then the next time, uh, you've got to go more often. I had a guy come in one time and he was using. Uh, three or four sprays in both nostrils every hour. Wow. And he was, you know, running through Afrin oh. right and left. And and then when he stopped it, it was, you know, he was just solid, socked in, right. no no opening. Right. And it took uh, weeks to get past it. Yeah. Uh, that, that story of with, withdrawal rebound, Valium is that another example. Yes. You, you take Valium, oh, I'll give you relief of anxiety, more relief of anxiety, more relief of anxiety. Right. Now you stop it, and now you've got yeah. anxiety. Right. So I think we have to be really careful about those drugs. You, you say Lumify looks to be safe, but, but. Treat the root cause and do it under a doctor's direction. Right. Uh, let's, uh, the, um, I think uh, that we can talk about lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and other causes of dry eye. Yep. But how often is dry eye from drugs they're taking for their bladder, drugs that they're taking for their congestion, whatever? Well, so many drugs uh, affect the secretions in our body, including the tear film. And it's sometimes hard to figure out because our eyes naturally produce less tears over the years also. And so you're balancing, you know, should they be on these allergy medications that really dry them out? But if they don't take them, they're not comfortable. And that's why sometimes we call it in medicine a multidisciplinary approach. Yeah. You have a great doctor who's putting a patient on an oral medication and they're sending them to their optometrist or ophthalmologist to talk about the dry eye issues. They're talking and figuring out what's best for the patient. So it's a, it's a balance, isn't it? It really is. And if I could tell you one that as an eye surgeon we think about a lot, we really wish that all patients that are being put on Flomax for the, the men that you know, want to not go to the restroom so much at night, you'd be amazed how it affects their pupil. And in cataract surgery, you got this big lens sitting behind the pupil. And if the pupil is big when you dilate it, easy access, easy surgery. When the pupil's little from Flomax, they get what we call floppy iris syndrome, and it makes cataract surgery more challenging. Now, we know what to do, but what we like is when the doctor who's putting the patient on Flomax says, are you having any vision issues? Have you seen your eye doctor lately? If you're having blur, you may want to take care of your cataract before going on Flomax because that entry Gonna get smaller. Gonna get smaller. <laughs> and that would be a dreamy for the eye surgeons of the world. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's a lot of people on Flomax. Yes. Yeah, and, it, uh, and it's a wonderful yeah. medication, right. but uh, there are side effects. Yep, but, and we know how to deal with it. It's just nice if there's some communication ahead of time. Yes. Oh, what about fans in the room, blowing air, wind in the eyes, yeah. you know, and of course, if you're outside a lot, the wind is blowing, oh, and then of yeah. course there's more than wind blowing. There's right. the dirt in the air, and the, yep. the, the harvest is being done, and so yep. half of the wheat you know, yep. is, is going at your eyes. Too. So some of the worst drying effects you can have are from ceiling fans while you sleep. Because one of the problems is oh, really? people don't shut their eyes all the way when they sleep. Really? Some people do, some people don't, and some of the dry eye issues that people can have from ceiling fans. Now, if you aren't having the dry eye issues, of course the ceiling fan is fine. But if you're having bad dry eye issues and treatment doesn't get rid of it, turn off the fan. Think about the ceiling fan. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever heard of recurrent erosion, but you know if you get a paper cut or a fingernail scratch on the eye, yeah. how painful that abrasion is. Yes. It's one of the most painful things known to man. 
Well, if you have a real dry eye at night, sometimes the eyelid surface can stick to the cornea and tug off some of those cells and cause a recurrent abrasion or a recurrent erosion. Turning off the ceiling fan and treating the dry eye can cure that. Now, are there artificial tears? You know, I'm not talking about red out. Right. I'm nervous about red out. Yep. But what about artificial tears that would replace the tears that I have? Of course, nothing is as good as, as your own. As your own. But they are very good. And I, I, again, I know I say this a lot. It's nice if you do it under the direction of your doctor. Yes, you can get the artificial tears over the counter, but do it under the direction of your doctor. Get that yearly exam and together decide, should I be on artificial tears that have preservatives in because I don't need them that often? Or is it time for me to go to preservative free, the little unit dose packs that you put these preservative free, beautiful drops on your eyes. And, and so that's the but big- But they're way more expensive. They're way more expensive, but there are drops with disappearing preservatives and different technologies to try to make it a multi-dose also. But those are things you wanna discuss with your doctor so you have a diagnosis, you have a treatment plan, and you understand the innovation that's happening um, in even like the artificial tear market. So, it, uh, and even though you have said that you should go to your doctor to get this, is there a brand that you prefer of artificial tears preservative free? No. No. You I, have no pref I really don't. Um, I think that all of those that go through the FDA approval process and they're labeled preservative free are beautiful drops. Can you get those over the counter? You can get them over the counter. Okay. And so I don't think you need to feel like there's a certain brand that just, you know, is heads, is and, heads and tails above the others. Okay. That's a good answer. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, LASIK surgery. And I know that <clears throat> surgery is always fraught with a small percentage. No, I don't care what surgery it is. Right. Even medicine. Uh, when you're caring for people, there's a time when some people have a problem. Right. A bad result happens. Right. But tell me about LASIK, uh, nationwide bad results, and, and who, who, what, what should we be doing different? Well, whenever you do anything, uh, there's a risk. You know, when you do contact lenses, you have a risk of an infection, ulcer, scar, you know, need a new cornea. I'm a huge fan of contact lenses when they're done with good exams and, and, and taking, but there's risks. And the same thing with surgery, there's risks. There's risks of infection. And there's also, you know, fortunately the infection risk is very low. But one of the problems with LASIK is here, being involved in the development, seeing it since the, its beginning, and seeing various levels of commitment to technology. Centers that feel like what's gonna attract patients is a cheap price, and then centers on the other end that are, you know, feeling what attracts a patient is safety. I have a tendency to be right here. I feel like with all this beautiful technology that's been developed to keep it as safe as possible, that it's worth investing in. In other words, do it right or just don't do it. But let's say someone's done it right and they've still had a problem because you've heard of people that have committed suicide from having things done with their eyes, like LASIK, and they could not find relief from eye irritation. And it's one of the hardest things as someone who helped develop this procedure that changed the world to see. But what's even harder is to realize that something could have been done. And sometimes it's related to how our eyes are balanced. And when we wear glasses, you, you've seen nearsighted glasses are thick on the edge and yeah. thin in the center? Yeah, yeah. Well, when you read, your eyes turn in. And for a nearsighted person in glasses, they get a prismatic effect. With the nearsighted glasses thick on the edge, thin in the center, they get a base in prism effect that often is a relief. Well, sometimes when they go to contact lenses, they don't have that base in prism that they need for computer or reading. And then they have trouble with contacts, they can take them off. Well, when you do laser vision, you can't take it off. And so what you wanna do is you wanna to go to a center 
that's not only using the world's best technology for treatment, but also for diagnostics, so that you can figure out that your eyes are in proper balance, or you are someone that needs PRISM and you shouldn't have it done, or if you do have it done, you may still need the PRISM. But the beautiful thing about LASIK, done right, it's studies have shown that it's one of the most successful surgeries known to man. But if it's not respected, it can ruin someone's life. You want to have someone experienced help you make that decision. Okay, and, and I would say that's probably you. But, you know, you've been, been there from the beginning. Yep. And now I have a number of quick uh, kind of questions. One of them has to do with blue light filter. Yeah. What is that? Well, you know, blue light is a part of our world, and it's actually very important for our ri circadian rhythms, for our awake cycles, and it can affect our sleep cycles if we get too much. You know, I was talking to an astronaut once, and he said that... He, he spent all this time in the International Space Station and for a few hours before bedtime they wouldn't let him look at the earth because of all the blue light that they would get it would be like taking two cups of coffee. And so you get blue light from your iPad or your phone and your kids on it all the time or you're doing it right before bed and trying to figure out why you're not sleeping so good or you're on your computer all day long without a blue light filter. So it's computer light. Yes, and I work with a company actually called Healthy, H-E-A-L-T-H-E. And you should go to their website and you should download the brochure about the hazards of blue light and what we can do about it and what's proper balance. What's that again, H-E-A-L-T-H-E? It's health with an E on the end, H-E-A-L-T-H-E. -E. E. And, and, and there's just a beautiful, I helped write it, uh, report on how we live in a light full of blue light and what we need to do about it to protect our children and ourselves. So I've got a reader, an e-reader, uh, that glows very low, yeah. low level yep. at bedtime. Yep. So I don't wake my wife. So yep. I can, you know, roll over and. But ideally, it has it would have a blue filter screen, or you would have a set of lenses on that are filtering that blue. Say that last sentence. A set of eye lenses on, because you can have blue light filter put in your glasses. And you think it's that important? I mean, this is this is something the blue light you really know, does mess up your. So your rhythms. If if you are sleeping beautifully and it's not affecting you, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I mean, this is it's not something that's going to do something else to you. It's about affecting your sleeping cycle and those types of things. And 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 that's why you want to study the effects of blue light and just realize if you're on a computer all day long, ask your company to have blue light filters. <coughs> so if you're a person working outside in South Dakota in the winter. Yeah. It's awfully blue out there, or it's white blue, isn't it? I right. mean, do you sense that there's that blue light thing yeah, happening? But I think it? that's okay. It's also part of our health. I don't think we need to be filtering out all blue light. Yeah. But we're meant to be working out in the daylight. We, we are meant to have right. time with the light. Right, exactly. He, uh, there are too many people living in indoors in right. the winter. We need to get outside. It's soaking. about balance. And with all the electronic <laughs> devices, yeah. there's so much electronic devices that emit blue light. That's where we need to think about it. I don't wow. think you have to worry about it outside. Macular degeneration is an issue that's very important to elderly people. Tell me what we know about macular. I know that glaucoma, we lose our peripheral vision. Right. And we keep our center vision until the end. Right. Macular degeneration, you lose our central vision, right? And we keep our peripheral vision, and that's why you know I tell you know macular degeneration patients, you're not gonna you know go lights out because you have this peripheral vision, but it's that frustrating you know can't see faces and those yeah. types of things that you want to prevent, and so there's the dry form. And then there's the wet form. And the wet form is where blood vessels are growing into the retina yes. that can hemorrhage, and that is the wet. 
the dry form is the one that's been you know shown that you know nutrients and and and, and having green leafy vegetables and things that are you know high in antioxidants and things like zinc or taking medications like Preservision or Occuvite and those types of things but again do under the direction of your eye doctor because you want to have a good exam and see if you have it you also want to see if you're developing the wet form because the wet form is what can really deteriorate your vision fast and we can inject on that and I mean, that's right treatments. that's right we've got drugs anymore that you go to a good quality retina specialist and they will inject drugs that will stop those blood vessels from proliferating and bleeding and so it's something that you can actually control but you need to get those exams and be treated Eye grain, uh, I learned about eye grain glasses yeah. uh, and eye grain, uh, migraine, kind of eye grain, uh, migraine yeah. uh, type of story uh, it, you know, in one of the shows that you have been on here yeah. before. Uh, what are they and, and what's, what's your take on them right now? Well, I'm a big believer um, and I think if you have headaches that you know, aren't responsive to traditional medications and you're frustrated or you're having a ton of eye strain um, at your computer and nothing seems to help, or even sometimes dry eye symptoms that just aren't responding to dry eye therapy, meaning it's probably not dry eye, it's more related to eye strain, it oftentimes can be related to how our eyes work together. And you know, the macula that you were just talking about is our area of sharp vision. And if I'm looking at something and I draw a straight line from that object of interest through my pupil to my retina, it hits my macula. We call it the line of sight. And But when the other eye's line of sight has to work then there's a space, there's a place where your eyes are just naturally supposed to be at rest. And let's say your place is at 100 yards, but you're at a computer all day long and your eyes are having to work hard to do that. Well, it can stimulate a nerve that we call the trigeminal nerve that innervates our brain and our eyes, and you can get headaches, headaches. and eye strain. We call it asthenopia in our fancy words eye strain. I got 30 seconds left. And, and, and dry eyes. And so by getting that measured and getting the proper prism for that distance you're working, whether you're a truck driver falling asleep from this or whether you're on a computer and you're getting headaches, you can have it treated by neural lenses. They're special called lens. neural lenses. Wow. And they have special prism in them to help people. So that should give someone a clue to do. One quick uh, floaters, 10 seconds. Most floaters go away, but you want to be evaluated because sometimes it means there's a tear in the retina that's going to lead to a retinal detachment. Get your floaters checked out. Get your pupils dilated. Make sure the retina is okay. The majority are benign, but every now and then it's a retina problem. All right. Very good. And now for tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Dry eye sometimes causes watery eyes. It is often due to medicines like decongestants or bladder spasm meds and occurs in twice as many women than in men. True or false? And the answer is? True. True. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic. Browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. Washington Irving once said, there is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, or of unspeakable love. Normal human tears are a biologic wonder, composed of a watery portion for providing the cornea hydration and nutrition, 
a mucus lubrication component for making it tear slimy, and a third thin layer of oil for slowing evaporation. Put together, you have the astonishing, life-sustaining, curative, slippery, and slow-to-evaporate human tear. Vision is completely dependent on tears because of the cornea, for purposes of transparency, is designed without blood vessels and is kept alive only by the nutrition it receives from tears. Dry eye is from many causes involving the eye surface. It is further described as symptoms from the loss of the effectiveness of tear film. These symptoms include pain, itching, burning, redness, and mucus around the eye with fluctuating vision that interferes with recreation, reading, and even driving. Paradoxically, watery eyes usually indicate a dry and inflamed eye with reactive and poor quality tears. The most common causes for dry eye are side effects from many medications. These include decongestants, antihistamines and meds for acne, fluid excess, blood pressure, and bladder spasm meds. Environmental causes include extensive reading, eye surgery, excessive computer use, contact lenses, low humidity, wind and fans in the face, and the result of a diet without enough oil or certain minerals and vitamins. Primary medical causes for dry eyes include immunological conditions like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, low thyroid, Sjogren's syndrome, vitamin A deficiency, and just plain aging. Dry eye affects twice as many women as men, and in the U.S. alone we spend $3.8 billion in healthcare dollars for this condition with societal costs estimating at $55 billion a year. For treatment, we should focus on which situations cause symptoms and then find ways to avoid those situations. We can include in our diet enough fish, flaxseed or flaxseed oil, liver, carrots, broccoli, and walnuts. Protective eyewear can help. Doctors treat some cases with surgery by plugging the tear ducts that drain tears away. Eye drops that reduce inflammation can help. Artificial tears are often prescribed, but as helpful as tears from a dropper may be, they are never as good as the real deal. Nothing will ever compare to the value and the sacredness of a human tear. A big thank you to Vance for volunteering to come to our studio in Jaeger Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University and add his experience and knowledge to this discussion tonight. It was thank wonderful, you. Vance. Thank you for having me. Thank you. If you'd like more information about this program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Well, that does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. On Call with the Prairie Doc is very important to a lot of people uh, in this area and in this region because it communicates a lot of very valuable information on health care. This project takes dollars. We have a great foundation called the Healing Words Foundation that oversees this whole operation and is responsible for some of the fundraising to promote these programs. So the website is prairiedoc.org, O-R-G, prairiedoc.org. Go there, donate if you're so inclined, and we thank you very much. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by
Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Dock on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Dock as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medical Care Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avira Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialist, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, Flandreau District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic, Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftel Communications.